How many of you guys in this room have heard the traditional African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child? Anyone? And that is so apparent today in today's society when we think about this, that it really does, especially when we're talking about the maturation of our youth. You see, the Masurian tribe in Africa, they are very well invested into their culture. And one of the things that's very empowering with them is they are known in Africa as one of the most fierce tribes known in Kenya. And one of the things they do when they go and greet each other face to face, the first thing they always say is, Kasirian and Gure, which means, are the children well? And regardless, on the other end of that, that individual in that village will respond, even if they don't have children, with, yes, the children are well. You see, that is the pinnacle of everything right now that makes their village so successful is because it is about their children. They understand the dynamics of how important it is to invest in the educational means, the communication between their children. You see, in America right now, our village is more important than ever. You see, we're growing up in this fast-paced, data-driven information world. And students today in school, they're met with a myriad of challenges and opportunities. And many families and support systems, they don't have that village. So what happens? Well, let's look at that. Most of us, we've grown up in an unstandardized world, would you say? We wear different clothes. We think different thoughts. We eat different foods. But when it comes to education, many of us are measured based upon our standardized test scores and grade level standards that we are expected to achieve greatness in order to succeed. So what happens? Think about this. What happens when you take that child from an unstandardized upbringing and you put them into a standardized system? Well, that is where the achievement gap is born. And today I want to shine some light on really what can we do? Everyone in the crowd, everyone watching this on YouTube, what can we do that's not going to cost a lot of money or time or effort, but to make every one of us, whether we're in middle school, high school, a parent, a grandparent, to get up and make change to help this close this gap? Because this is affecting us everywhere, especially within the United States. You see, what's very interesting is I started doing research on this because I wanted to make sure that A, I was prepared, and B, I knew what I was talking about. So I looked at some of the statistics, and one of my forms of statistics I looked up was under the McKinsey Company, looking at, on a global scale in terms of economics, what the impact of the achievement gap was happening. And did you know that lagging achievement can be seen as early as fourth grade? Fourth grade is one of the strongest predictors in terms of student success and graduation rates in high school, as well as college graduation, not to mention lifetime earnings in fourth grade. And it's also shown that individuals lagging in performance on standardized tests in fourth grade will also be behind in eighth grade. And if a student is in behind in eighth grade, they will enter in most cases, the job force with lower pain and lower skilled jobs, all based upon the data that was shown. You see, in addition to that, when we look at individuals who are less educated, we see higher incidence rates of morbidity like obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. You know, I was at a TEDx conference up in the Silicon Valley at the Harker School, and I was asked to be a mentor. And it was a great experience because I was taking an Uber home. And while I was waiting for the Uber, she pulled right up, and I got in the back seat. She was a 71-year-old African-American lady. And she was full of life, because the minute I got in the car, I knew I was going to have a good time because we were talking. And she asked me what I did, and I started talking about education. And I could see in the review mirror, her eyes started to well up a little bit. Like, she started to close off, but then she opened up right away. And my goal with every individual that I come in contact with, whether it be personally or professionally, is to how can I learn from this person? What can I get out of this person that will make me a better person? So she started talking about, okay, I grew up, I was one of five siblings. 
My parents died in a freak accident when I was four years old. And I grew up with my grandparents in a farm in the south of Mississippi. And my grandparents were the ones who raised me. And my job, and what my grandfather told me, was the minute I started living on the farm, that I was to help raise my siblings, brothers and sisters, as well as I was supposed to contribute to the livestock on here. So she knew as early as first grade, she wanted to be different than her brothers and sisters. So she decided the first day, just like her friend, she was going to go to school. First grade. So she got ready, went to school the first day, and she came back home to tell everyone about it. And when she got home, her grandfather beat her. Because he said that education is not going to help support in terms of raising your brothers and sisters, and will not put food on the table by raising our livestock, and you will not go to school. And so her brothers and sisters never went to school. But for 11 years, she snuck out of the house every morning. She went to school. She didn't miss one day of school. And she made a pact with her brothers and sisters that when she got a real job, she would help support them and get them out of that same situation. And so they lied for her for 11 years straight. And she was the first person in her life and her family, to graduate from high school. She even went on to go to graduate from college. Now, interesting enough to say, I made to mention a point about less educated individuals, higher rates of morbidity. Two of her brothers died at 20 and 22 from cardiac arrest due to being extremely overweight. Both of her sisters died in the early 30s due to diabetes from being extremely overweight. And she contributed that because, to that, that the students who taught her to take care of herself, while her brothers and sisters, they never went to the doctor. They never got themselves checked out because they just, she claims that weren't educated enough to know what the well-being and how the system worked. You see, these are some empowering stories when I look at the achievement gap, and this is one example of a family gap. You know, in, similar, in a similar vein, I wanted to start looking at, in my own work, what happens when opportunity is faced with a challenge. Do students really have a chance? Is failure destined for them? So what what I do for work, basically in a nutshell, is I work bringing communities together. I want to really focus on getting kids, primarily from underserved communities, into college. And that's really what it's about. And so one night I was having a parent night. And this really, really opened my eyes up to what's going on within the educational system. And this isn't something I'm going to point the fingers at teachers, administrators, not even parents. Because what happened was that night, it kind of changed my life. I got there early to set up, and the design for the night was to have a parent night to have, bring the community together, bring people in from uh, professional businesses, bring people in from uh, city council, bring people in to show support, to show parents from first-generation backgrounds that, hey, your kids have a chance. So what happened was I brought them in, and as I was setting up about, a, about an hour prior to, I saw in the corner of the distance this mom and her daughter walk in. And I was so excited because who shows up early to any sort of event? So I walked directly to her because she sat in the back, and I stuck my hand out. And I looked down, and I was excited, and I said, thank you for coming. My name is Dustin. And she looked at me, and she didn't return the favor. She didn't stick out her hand, and so I was a little off guard. But she did do something that kind of caught me off guard. She took her glasses off. She said something that is still reverberating in my head. She said, why am I here? Why is this important? And first thing I wanted to say is I wanted to say, yeah, it's important. But I didn't come out that way. I kind of took a step back and I said, well, you're here because we're doing a college readiness night. Your daughter took a practice assessment with us and we're really setting you up for success in ways to pay for college, figuring out what is the best track, whether it's college or career for your daughter. And she said, I don't want my daughter going to college. It's too expensive. And I want her to get a job immediately after graduating high school in order to contribute to society. And once again, I took a step back, and I had to realize that there is some sort of disconnect there. And it's the educational knowledge that she is lacking. So I said, here's the deal completely understand, but since you're here, do you mind going and, you know, if you want to grab some food, take a seat. 
Spend a few minutes and see if you get anything from here. I'd love your feedback at the end. So I gave the presentation that night, and, she, and everybody was filtering, saying, hey, thank you, and they were leaving. And I noticed at the back corner of my eye, she was still sitting in the chair. But I didn't know because my vision is not very good. And I, I didn't know if she was laughing, crying, angry. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to start packing up my stuff, and hopefully she got something out of the night. But I saw her coming towards me, and I was just I was a little timid. And she came up to me, and she asked, she said, excuse me. I said, yes, and she stuck out her hand. She said, hi, my name's Anne, and you've opened my eyes tonight. And I kind of got what she was saying. I kind of was figuring out. And she told me that this was the first time in 17 years from being a single mother raising three kids and not being home for the last four years to read books to her daughter before bed or the other siblings, that she was able to look at her daughter's transcripts and realize that she had a 4.6 GPA. She was number two out of 798 kids in her class, and her score on the practice SAT was in the 98th percentile for the first time without any preparation and did not realize the opportunity that her daughter had sitting right there because she thought her path was set to send her into the working force. And if you look at that from perspective, that's what's going on with this achievement gap. There's a multitude of other things that we're looking at, but where it comes down to right now is it comes down to our village. It comes down to local support. It comes down to making change within our village. It's not, it's not looking at a teacher and pointing your finger and expecting them to f- fix the situation. Even they're a, they're a, they are working on areas to really improve test scores, improve uh, the system. But it's about us. It's, even if you're a middle school student, you're a high school student, you're a parent, anyone, everyone can make a change. You know, one of the things that I looked at in my, in my, in my last story that I'll leave you with I work with one of the most beautiful schools that I've ever been to. It's in South Central Los Angeles. It has the -the state-of-the-art swimming pool, the most amazing track and field system I've ever seen. It makes me want to run, but I don't. It's amazing. The classrooms have the most amazing technology. And six years ago, it was the lowest performing high school in California. It was ridden by gang violence. It was so bad the school almost went back to the state. It was atrocious. They were getting rid of teachers left and right, rehiring, trying to get talent on campus. The enrollment for a school that was built for about 2,500 students was dwindling down to about 900, 1,000 students. No one wanted to go there. So what happened was they hired a new principal, and he said, my mission is to help close the gap to figuring out how we can get students here. So what he did is he started recruiting. He picked out the most amazing things the school had, which were academics and sports, and he also looked at the the dance, because they had a huge dance studio, so art and dance. And so one of the things he decided to do is he would take every one of these core groups, the football team, the band, the cheerleaders, and he would walk, take them down once a year, and take them down this huge strip down the middle of the city to the middle school and show them how amazing high school was, how they've changed. And what happened is over those years, more students started applying to get into that school. This is just a small example of how you're able to close the gap by not putting a lot of money or effort and time. It's just bringing a community together. I mean, when you look at things, you look at yourself, how can I make an impact? And the impact is within yourself. The impact is getting, if you want to make a big change, it's finding a school, a local school within your community, and figuring out what you can do to contribute. I mean, even business owners. I mean, when you look at powerful cities, one of the things that that schools do is to make them unique, uh, is, well, to make them less unique, is a lot of underperforming schools, one of the things that they like to do to make, to solve the situation pretty instantly, is they'll get rid of, when, when test scores are bad, they'll get rid of things like art, drama, Spanish, and they'll replace it with things like test prep in order to hit the mass means of the students to get test scores up, those district and state mandated tests, so they're able to obviously meet the middle. But when you look here, you look just a few zip codes around, 
those affluent schools, they're not getting rid of Spanish. They're adding Mandarin. They're adding French to the curriculum that makes them stand out. So what I implore with everyone here today is that if you really want to make an impact, schools are the first line of defense. And we must know that in terms of ending poverty and in terms of closing the achievement gap. So if there's anything you want to do today to help contribute to this society, to change the way that people are graduating and entering the workforce with higher paid and higher skilled jobs, changing the way that our, our world and our economy is dealing with education right now, then it's up to you. Find that school, bring that community that you want to see within that school, and you will make a difference. Because sitting around expecting it to happen and blaming other people, it's not going to be the, it's not the result, it's not the reason. So thank you.